Hi, I'm Erica and welcome back to the Art Desk. Today I'm going to go a little more in depth on what I use to create my sometimes very tiny works of art. I'll cover the materials themselves, why I choose what I do, and how material choices impact my final product. Let's get started. Let's start at the beginning. What are we putting this art on? I use two different grounds when I create my pieces. Sometimes I will use actual animal skin vellum, or I will use a modern equivalent, a vegetable-based parchment called pergaminata. Now, you can see that the vellum is quite beautiful and varies greatly in color, translucency, and texture. Some of them even have small imperfections, like this hole here, or a little bit of discoloration, like we see in the corner of this piece. However, these imperfections are entirely period and are seen in books that are revered today. So all of these pieces are perfectly fine. I could use any of them for one of my pieces. And because books come in varied sizes as well, some of these pieces could even be used for two pages instead of just one. Pergaminata varies as well, although there are only four options instead of the wider varieties of vellum. In perg, you'll find either natural or white, and it really only comes in two different weights. A very, very translucent, lightweight, or what they call their heavyweight, which is still fairly translucent. Given that the majority of my work tends to be displayed flat, I tend to go with the heavier weight. There are links in the description for all of the materials I'm talking about today, and as a reminder, this is not a sponsored video. So. How do I get started once I've decided what I want to put my artwork on? Well, I get started like any other artist with a mechanical pencil, a ruler in millimeters, and my trusty erasers. Now, for my work, I will find some sources that I like, find a little bit of inspiration, work up a rough draft in a digital program, usually using my tablet, and then print that out and trace. I will rough in my ideas and then go in freehand and do the fine detail. Now, the difference between, say, Bristol or watercolor paper and the perg that we talked about earlier, and especially the vellum we talked about earlier, is that with perg and vellum, you do have to clean the surface first. That's where our trusty white eraser comes in. With Perg, you just erase over the top, use my brush, brush, which is specifically for getting eraser dust off of my paper. And then it's off to the races, getting your artwork transferred on. Get it all drawn in, get it all perfect, and perfect those areas with your trusty kneadable eraser. Now, if the outlining here needs to be in black, which is entirely up to you, this is the time to do it. So we will pull our, out our India ink and our crow quill nib and go to town. Get those lines all nice and black, exactly how you want them. If I know I'm going to be doing black work in an area that's going to be largely plate painted. I tend not to do those in the ink. I'll go back and do those in black paint once the piece is the majority way done. But for the outlines in particular, especially on areas that are going to be gold, always do your ink first. Now that our ink is well and truly dry, and I do try to let that sit overnight just to make absolutely sure it's dry, we're gonna go in and do the really fun part, the gold. Now, when you're doing a piece like this, if you're going to be using gold leaf, 
and this is our absolutely magnificent and totally hard to work with gold leaf. Now is the time to do that. Always, always, always do your gold leaf before you do your color. Why? Well, the paper we're working with is matte. It's not glossy. So things will stick to that. And if your gold sticks to your paint, it's never coming up. So now you've got to try and paint over gold leaf. And it's, that's difficult and honestly not something you want to waste your time trying to correct. So do the gold first and save yourself a headache. Now, if you're only going to use gold paint, and here's two examples of the gold paint that I use, you're not gonna have the same issue because you're not laying a large sheet of gold down on your work. I still tend to do the gold first because I use shell or museum gold. It's 24 karat gold inside of a binder with no chalk. You can tint the gold by painting another color behind it, such as ochre or crimson, or you can just let it have the color of the ground underneath it. If you use something such as a fine tech gold or a gold gouache, those have a bit less translucency. Some of the gold gouache is downright opaque. So depending on the look you want, choose the gold you want. There are a lot of options and they're all completely valid. And once your gold is all set and in place, we get to the main event, the color. This is honestly the best part for me of working in a medieval style, throwing modern ideas of color out the window and working in palettes that are specific to a various time or place. I find a great deal of beauty and zen in this highly precision work. This is where my custom mixed palettes come into play and these are just two and they look a mess but it's because I work from cake like you would with watercolor. For larger pieces where I know the background is a quote straight from the tube color to start, that is something that I have not custom mixed, I will sometimes work from a tube instead of from cake, but that's not very often. When you're working with your paint, you want the consistency of melted ice cream or heavy cream. If you're rehydrating, like we have here, that means adding some water to your paint and then going and making a cup of tea or something else that will occupy 20 to 25 minutes of your time. I make a really slow cup of tea, okay? But once your paint is hydrated, your paint is ready. And then you can start laying down those beautiful areas of color that we love so very, very much. So now that our paint is nice and hydrated, what are we gonna put it on the page with? Well, we're gonna use this right here. I would say 99.9%, .9 if not 100% of my work is done with this exact style of brush. It is a number one round Princeton Velvet Touch. And again, this is not a sponsored video, FYI. If you like it though, I put a link at the bottom and you can go buy one for yourself. I love this, these brushes. The, they come to a beautiful point. They hold the perfect amount of paint and they are resilient brushes. Does this mean that this is the brush you have to use? No, it does not. My work is very small. Here's the brush. You can see this brush would definitely hold enough paint to let me get all of these areas of blue, for instance, to finish this white line with one smooth stroke. So yes, my brush looks tiny, but there's a reason. Now that we've gone through all of our materials from our fantastic ground to the vibrant colors, it's time to use them. Come back for the next video and see how I use these magnificent materials 
to create a stunning green and gold dragon. I'll see you next time at the art desk.